I've been wanting to do a video on Colossal, a solo RPG adventure for a while, but and it's been requested by people on the channel quite a bit, but I wanted to wait until I could also talk about the expansion to Colossal, which is the Roomlands expansion, and it offers so much more content, some rules, some additional rules that I think personally make the game much more playable for me. And most of this video is going to talk about the expansion. It is physically a bigger book. You can see the, the difference here in the length. And as I say, conceptually, I think it opens it up a little bit with some very light oracles and random tables that give a little bit of direction to what is, in essence, a journaling game. And what we're going to do in this video is give a brief overview of what we have with Colossal and then get into more of a detailed look at the expansion. As mentioned, this is a journaling game and we'll take a look at the back of the book. It says, Welcome to the world of Colossal. Prepare to get lost in a world of your own imagination, steered by the rules within this book. This is a, it tells you, you write your character's journal as they explore the strange lands of Colossal, a castle so colossal that fields, valleys, mountains, and even oceans rest within its rooms. In this main book, there's four character classes and a very basic rule set. It tells you you need pen, paper, deck of playing cards, and the book to play. So the conceit of the game is that the entire universe is within the castle walls here, and you are a lone adventurer traveling around. You are, you have goals and missions. We look here at the credits for the game. You do have the the concept that you are exploring and having encounters. And so the world is described as a place where no adventurer has found the exterior of the castle, though many have tried. And it is surrounded by threats, such as strange animals and beasts, as well as the greatest danger being the rooks. These are huge hulking stone automatons that patrol somewhat mindlessly out in the wilds of the Colossal's rooms. If you disturb them, you can encounter them, have combat with them, and attain magic from them. They are the only place that has magic in this world. And here is a visual depiction, perhaps, of one of them with some explorers. The, the, the visual components of this book are very key to being involved in the world. There are very basic stats, as it were, for characters. There's calling, nature, they have a class and a weapon. But you're drawing your character's calling and your character's nature randomly through a deck of, you know, a card draw in a deck of cards. So for example, here we could just randomly pull this four of spades. And in this case, the four, the spades is meaningless, but the four tells us that our calling is, you have a vision as you sleep one night far across the lands in a room that looks nothing like the room your village resides in is a tower. The tower looks like it might have been a rook once, thin and impossibly tall with its slender arms by its side. In your vision, you see a weapon in a room at the very top of the tower waiting, calling for you. Your village has been besieged by rooks lately. Your hunters are stretched thin. Maybe if you could reach this mythical place, you might be able to save your village. So that is in essence a a prompt for your character, a reason for your character to do something. Your character's nature in this case is going to be an ace. You're happy-go-lucky, extremely optimistic, and fun. And then you can choose your class. And basically, this is where you get your two stats, in essence, your exploration score and your combat score. In this case, this stat is the armed, literally armed person who has an appendage or appendages onto their, grown onto their body that is a weapon. And they are a combat heavy class. And the, 
dots here or the colored in squares represent the number of playing cards you draw when you do that activity. So for example, here, if you were in combat, your combat options would be represented by a four card draw and each of these cards would mean something in combat. For exploration, you would be drawing just three cards to reference tables to see what you would develop out of the prompts for these cards. And that are, that is in sum the mechanics of the game. You can see here the journaling aspect because during character creation, you are given a lot of questions and prompts to develop your character. So if you're playing this armed class, are you a hunter who felled their first rook and wished to wear the arm as a trophy? Does your village or clan fit rook arms to their children to equip them for the harsh life of living in the colossal? Did you lose a limb of your own in a battle when young and have the rook limb fitted as a replacement? And so on. So you can see that it is your prompted to write these things down and create the background for your character, even though you've been given a little bit with the prompts earlier for the calling. Here's another class is the followed. And this has a, this class has a small rook companion, like a pet or familiar that follows them and their commands. And you can see here, this is a major exploration class. So when you do exploring, you get to choose you get to pull in five cards to interpret as opposed to the other class that only had three. But here with your combat, you're only given an option of three cards for the combat choices. And again, you fill out your character and cr finish creating your character by answering these types of questions. So does your Rookling have something special about it? a strange crest or hand that looks like a key. What is the bond with your rookling? Is your rookling the core of a rook that killed someone close to your character, etc.? So putting this together, you would be building a character and then sending them off to explore a world. And the exploration is handled by these tables that will coincide with cards that you pull into your hand that you interpret as a group. So for example, this three of diamonds here is a, an organic thing, people or creature. And this represents a calling. You come across someone who is key to your calling. Maybe they have a clue about what you're looking for, or they block your way to learning more. Now, in this case, because it was a diamond, it's not friendly. So we remember back to the calling that we had, which concerned a, a vision that we had of a weapon in a room at the top of the tower. We may be able to find that, that weapon and this mystical place to save our village. So now in this case, we are, are coming across somebody who is thwarting that, yet they have their key to it or they have a connection to us. So the game would be building out what that is. In the course of the game, you will be traveling places and having events and there are related tables. For example, if you have if you're out on the ocean, you would roll on, or not roll on, but refer to this table when you pulled in your card. So a three of spades on this table is representing a shipwreck. It's intact. You pull up alongside the wrecked vessel. It is intact. You can explore within and find two items, and there is an item table. Or if it's wrecked, you can find a single item. Well, we pulled in a black card, so it would be intact. And that would be the prompt for continuing along your story. There are some cities here, again, with their own prompts and tables. This is to build out your city. And one of the cool things in the game concerning combat is that when you encounter a somebody to fight, you actually have to build your character and you build the character by, again, pulling in cards and creating the opponent that you are facing and giving them a weapon and giving some type of reward that you'll get for the combat and then fighting the combat, fighting the, 
the enemy. And you do the fighting by pulling in your number, your combat value of cards, as mentioned, and referring to the options that they give you and making those choices. But again, it's a narrative driven game with your own journaling and your own imagination. So there are not heavy rules for the fighting. And you can see how this works with, this is an example of the character sheet and it is really just filled in with various boxes where you narrate what is going on and then you just have your exploration and your combat score. So that's a real brief overview of what Colossal is and what I really want to get into showing you next is the expansion to it. I believe this is the first and only expansion that is now available or re-available and it is called the Roomlands and the first thing we're going to take a look at here is it does offer new places and new tables for those places and we will get into that but first let me show you the actually the very first thing we're going to look at here are the credits here and the but really what I want to turn to first are the rules additions the mechanical additions they're not many but they are significant and the first concerns the oh i can open right to it the oracles here so this is a general table that allows you to draw a card and map it onto a very basic yes no oracle and it is going to it's it's described as optional but it gives a little bit of direction. So if you're encountering something or you're writing up your own narrative, for example, of to just take this little thing that we were developing, this obstacle person or rook or enemy that we encountered that's related to our calling, we might want to say, is this somebody we know from our past or is this a an entity we've already encountered in life? So we could pull in this card and refer to it to this spot on the table and it's like no and it's worse than expected. So for example, maybe it's not somebody that we encountered in the past, but maybe it's somebody that our own ancestors encountered. Maybe there's someone from a different time and they have been spending decades or centuries of their existence plotting against us, just as an example. Or if we pulled in, in this card instead, we would get the answer, no, but there's an upside. So no, they're, they're not someone from our past, but even though they're described as being an obstacle to us, they feel some type of connection to us and are going to help us in some way. So you can just see how if you do solo role playing, you know, sometimes it is helpful to get just an arbitrary yes, no, maybe kind of thing to send you in some direction with your own story. So this generic resolution table to get a simple answer is very useful, I think. And it says here, you can use this table at any time, even mid combat if desired. And it says it's a constant solution to any questions or successes you might need. And this is where I think it can be very helpful in a journaling game, especially when you're trying to abstract or create or write down something at like combat. That can be a little challenging to move through without just saying like, yeah, we won or whatever. So I think in this particular case for this kind of game, this is really helpful. There's also an NPC generator here. Again, it's based on a card draw number here. It gives the name something about them and a characteristic. And in this case, they are rugged and suspicious. Not sure how that how helpful that would be. I think this could have possibly been a little bit more detailed, but it is there. And there's a story generator. And the story generator gives a storytelling the inciting incident so this is like to assist an archaeological dig at ancient ruins and the twist is love or you could obviously draw three cards instead of just one so to assist a unique rook stone and the storytelling twist will be treasure so that is going to give you 
something to add into your adventure. The suggestion is given that you could use it when you meet an NPC and you want to create a side quest. So for example, in, in this in this example here, you could be going along and decide that you want to go off in a different direction to help a rookstone with the goal of getting treasure. And then the other big rules addition that is offered in this supplement is a two-player co-op adventuring together rule. It says adventuring in the Colossal is typically a lonely life. It is not often that one meets another person who is willing to trek out with you but from time to time, this may happen. And it explains that you can have the positive side of having each other's back in combat and working together, or the negative that there could be rivalry and you're looking at the same treasure. So the, the rules for this are add, uh, the rules for the exploration and combat with two characters are given here. It plays slightly differently. So it's a cooperative storytelling game at that point. You need to sort of choose a leader and that's the person who's narratively taking the lead for that day's adventuring. And then you would choose the number of cards equal to that character's exploration score and then keep them in their hand. So they put the prompts together and then the other player takes a, draws a card and checks it against the encounter table for that setting, but doesn't really reveal what that is. They can decide if they want to tell the leader or not and how, what they want to make that into in the story. It could be a plot point or it could be just a description or it could be a complication and there are complication tables that are provided for that. So it's kind of like, and here are the complications. It could be a personal complication or an environmental complication. So it's cooperative, but it's almost like semi-cooperative because if you have two people, there's more obstacles put in the way to, it's, it's cleverly done to kind of represent two people who are actually doing something together that aren't necessarily always in consort. For a solo player, for a single person playing this game, it doesn't really make sense to play it with the two player. The two player aspect here is really for two different people so that you can have that kind of negotiation and the use of the complications table. So we'll look here just at an example of complication here with the queen of hearts. Let's say a personal complication would be a strange feeling comes over you both. You're poisoned work out how you might have gotten poison this encounter phase and then come up with a way to cure it or an environmental complication could be vantage point you come across something tall to climb a rook husk or tall tree if you choose to climb it check the oracle to see how successful your climb is if you make it to the top you can draw two full sets of encounter phases simultaneously representing kind of like looking around giving yourself options so I think uh, this is pretty useful. You could probably use this these tables actually just playing solo. Um, there is a two-player resolution oracle here where red is a bad outcome, negative, or the uh, no, and black is the good outcome, positive yes. And there are also combat two... Uh, two-player combat rules, which we don't have to get into, but it involves buffing up the scores of your enemies to provide a more appropriate resistance to two people attacking it rather than one, as well as the option of helping your partner if your partner is wounded. And it also gives you the option of attempting to do a combination attack and playing cards to try to match their suits. And if they match suits, a sort of blind match, it's a combo attack. And if it is not a match, then you wasted your attack. So clever use of the cards there. But again, noting that it is, you know, semi-cooperative in that you are finding yourself at times in opposition to your partner. And now we're going to get into looking at briefly a bit of the extended world here of the Colossal, that it has gotten bigger and that 
there are new and different places. One discovery are something called the crackways. These are massive cracks in the miles thick walls of the rooms. Some are dead ends, but some are long ago cave, caves carved long ago by ancient artisans. There's also the rafters, a place that Precious Little was known about doing, due to it being the home of the terrifying gargoyles from the first book, but now adventurers are returning from these highlands and bringing back tales of where the gargoyles are. And there's also a great city in this world, as well as a rumor of the sea stone, a legendary unique rook stone that doesn't conform to the typical three types of classic rook stones that are described in the first book. There's a couple of new character classes. There's an allied, which is basically working as a team, and the bastion, which is a recent and surprising discovery. And they are often viewed with fear or disgust because they're like person-sized rook constructs in the colossal. Same character creation rules here. There are some icy wastes known as the tundrum, and the there's a little indication here of saying that when you draw a door in your exploration phase from the main book, you can choose if the room on the other side is a tundrum, which is this icy waste, and if it is, you go to this encounter table. So there is a bit of back and forth between the books. If you are playing, incorporating this into your game, you will be directed at places to do that. And it does say that there is a page or there's a web page that gives you essentially this explaining if you come to what you come to in the old book and where you can reference in the new book. I didn't find that as of this filming, so I just made myself this chart when I was playing. So for example, behind a door, you could find this tundrum. If you encounter a gargoyle, you could go to the rafters, etc. But you know, maybe I just didn't. Maybe I just didn't find it. It's not that. Um, it's not that hard to map that out for yourself because it's clearly explained here. And here are the the rafters, and it says high above the room lands, but just before the ceilings are the rafters. These are massive beam-like structures that span the length and widths of the rooms, holding up the ceilings. When you draw a gargoyle in your standard exploration, you can choose to have it take you here, and you can also choose to navigate here via hole in the floor in the battlements module or the top of a staircase. Again, those are from the original book. And there are rules for expo exploration here, different types of gargoyles, rafters, encounters, tables. So a red card is going to be this prompt here is going to be, ooh, the gargoyle's nest. You come across a large cave in the towering vertical mountains that is clearly a nest of gargoyles. You can't enter here until you have found at least three clues on your encounters on the rafters. When you have found these clues and you return here, turn to page 91 to unlock the mystery of the gargoyles. So the clues are going to be in based in the black card, so you will be prompted to create a story of time spent in and around the gargoyles. And we have the crackaways here, again, familiar to the layout of these books, description of what it is, and then the notice for exploration and what, what a, a drawn card would mean. So in this case, this is a medium-sized, ooh, it's a trapped rook. You come across an agitated rook trapped in a large cavern, but not quite large enough for it. If you choose to fight it, use the combat rules from the base rulebook. So this, for example, could be a case where if you just don't know if you want to choose to fight it, you could go back to the oracle table and say, you know, if I fight this thing, will good come of it or whatever, and pull in a card and see what the oracle would tell you, and then base your decision on that draw. And it says that anytime you would draw either a cave, staircase, or door in your exploration phase, you can choose instead to replace that prompt with a crackaway. Crackaways have these unique encounter and tables, as mentioned. So you can also, in, in the additional material here, choose to create a biome for the place that you're in. So when you explore a new room or a new region, you could say that the whole room had a certain type of environment with you, or you could, for, for example, sail across an ocean and then 
find a new place and use these guides. To do. So for example, say you sailed across an ocean and then you drew a card, it was the five of diamonds, you would decide based on this that you ended up in a plains area. The plains are the best chance for human survival in the Colossal, thanks to their open areas suitable for farming. It does make them vulnerable to rook attacks, though. For the gameplay, you can choose to find a village every exploration phase while within the plains terrain. However, you might have to help them if they're attacked. So what's cool about the, the biomes here is it's not just giving you the terrain, but it's giving you the gameplay impact. So for example, if you ended up in a jungle, it says all rook combat can be ignored here as rooks cannot navigate the jungle. However, perhaps a wild animal might prove just as much of an opponent. And it tells you that you can use the standard rook combat rules on giant creatures found in the jungle. So that's a nice, another addition. And then this big addition here is a parapet. It's a massive city built within the husk of a truly massive long dead rook. So this entire city is within the husk of a rook. And it is a place where there is a hunter's guild that can provide new quests as well as a whole other yet another world of places and encounters within a tavern so sort of almost like a mini dungeon kind of thing within a whole rook within the colossal so you have tables here for creating basic quests from the Hunter's Guild. So you can pull cards to give you the location of the quest, a deep underwater, deep underwater in a clear lake. You can get a, what the reward of the quest is. This would be four treasures for a reward. And you have a twist, rumors of a rook that doesn't have ice, electric, or rumble powers. That is the magic in the world. So a rook without magic would be very strange indeed, and you would have a quest based on figuring out, well, why is that the case, and what do you, what do you need to do to figure that out? The great city itself has a number of districts, a market district, a guild town, etc., and for all these areas, you have prompts and you will pull in aspects of things that are like a city. So here, if you're in the Crescent, you notice a sign on a notice board for a Crescent resident seeking a bodyguard for an expedition outside the city. Their address is on the notice. If you want to help them with their expedition, you can create a quest using the Hunter's Guild quest creation system that we just saw and have them accompany you on it. And you could also create that character to go with you. Guild Town. We'll look here at Guild Town. An eccentric rooksmith inventor runs up to you, recognizing you as an adventurer. He needs you to test his latest invention out in the field. Draw a card. We'll do that. If it is red, it's not, then his invention is a new kind of arm that does something strange and specific. If it's black, then his invention is a mount that can traverse a new kind of terrain. If you choose to accept this request, take the invention out on your next expedition outside the city, but make sure to return to the inventor and let him know if his invention was any good or not. So again, you can see that it's giving you some narrative direction and it is just extending this world that much. And speaking of the ways in which this expansion lets you expand the world, there's something here called Rook Homes. And it says some Rooklanders manage something truly incredible. They live inside a still functioning defeated Rook. And it explains that how, explains what you need to do in combat basically to get a Rook Home for yourself. And when you have a Rook Home, you also have to maintain it because it's like a house. So again, there are tables here with card draws to indicate how much, how well functioning your rook home is or is not when you begin to occupy it and maintain it. And then we get to the oracles that we've already seen. And then the filling out the book after the co-op rules that we've also already seen are, is, are rules for what happens when you fight inside a rook. And so there are rules for internal 
combat and you only get one opportunity to try to fight the rook and enter it and there is a procedure of rules for that. But again, it's a one-page procedure and this is, as mentioned, a journaling game. So you will be developing a lot of that on your own. And then the final thing that I wanted to show in this book, without too much detail, is that there is a guided, it's called a guided solo colossal campaign adventure. It's basically a guided story that has a combination of the kinds of mechanics and things that you do in the main rule book, as well as in the earlier pages of this rule book, as well as an almost like choose your own adventure-ish type of situation where you need to do certain things before you can turn the page and get somewhere else. And I'm not going to show you too much about that. I'll just show you this one spread where it sort of shows you where you are. You get a location and then a specific table. In many cases, it's essentially like a D4 table based on the suit of the card that you draw, which will tell you what's going on and what you might find and where you can go. And you move through this adventure. I guess we could just page through it quickly. There's quite a bit of material here. In It's many pages long, and with the dedicated encounter tables, there is a lot it really does offer a lot in terms of guidance for a player that wants that type of guidance. And the black bar at the bottom of each page tells you what you need to complete or do in the adventure before you can turn the page and continue to go through it. So we'll just quickly flip through to the end there to finish that up. So that is a look inside this expansion for Colossal, the Roomlands. I think if you are new to the game it, and you have the ability to do it, I would pick up both to play because I think that for my style of play, now I've said in other videos, I am not a huge journaling solo RPG or player. There are journaling games that I've played and really enjoyed on this channel, like Thousand Year Old Vampire is the one that comes to mind first. There are others this is up right up there because of the richness of the world and because of the variety of random tables that give you enough suggestion to pull you in a direction. However, the Roomlands really offers a ton more of that. There's more random tables. And as I started to say at the outset of talking about this book, the presence of the oracle tables, as basic as they are, and of course you could have always created your own, but the presence of the oracle tables within this book I think is quite important, at least for my way of play, because I think without absent mechanics to direct you somewhere, I find that a straight journaling game can turn too much into just a writing exercise, a little bit too much away from what makes a game which would be for my take something involving mechanics at the very least and rules that the Oracle provides that external structure that you can go to, to give you an outside direction to move on with the gameplay. So that's a look at Colossal and Colossal, the Roomlands. And if you are, if you're a journaling role player and haven't played this game yet, absolutely, it's a must buy. If you are somebody who's interested in a kind of alternate reality, it is fantastical, but it's not fantasy per se. It's not straight fantasy genre. It's very, there's a mystical quality. There is a sense of being a small player in a large world that adds a almost a level of emotionality to the story where things seem to be both real and unreal and you are missing something and longing for something but not sure what it is. If any of that type of feeling appeals to you with solo RPG, this is also very much worth checking out.